Well, welcome to our online service, our first all-campus online service. We're so grateful that you guys are here. My name is Bill Reeser. Uh, I'm one of the pastors here at Church of the Savior, and I just want to let you know up front uh, that we're so grateful that you joined us wherever you are, in your living room, in your car. I hope you're not at Costco somewhere fighting someone for toilet paper, uh, but uh, I don't know what's a bigger crisis, this virus or the lack of toilet paper. Both of them stink, if you know what I mean. Uh, but uh, we're just so grateful that you joined us. And just as Will mentioned, uh, we want to encourage you not to watch the service. We want to encourage you uh, to engage, to hear what God's Word has to say, to, to get into His presence, and to see what God has for you today. Because I believe that today is going to be a special day. also want to let you know that you can follow online. Uh, our sermon notes are online. Uh, you can go to uh, uh, the comments section uh, to get the notes, or you can just uh, click on the church website and click on live stream uh, as well. And I also want to encourage you, as Anthony mentioned, uh, while we're not meeting and it pains us not to meet, but we have a, we have a responsibility uh, to take care of you, and we love you too much. Uh, not to take care of you, uh, but we have to continue the mission because I believe that the church is the answer. I believe that all answers come from, as we prayed, from heaven above. So I want to encourage you and I want to thank you in advance for continuing to support the mission of Church of the Savior by continuing to give online in so many different ways, and thank you for doing that. So let's pray for us, our message. Father, we just thank you so much. Uh, for your word. I just thank you so much for this gift of repentance, the joy of repentance, and how it just does so many things for us to get us into the place where you long for us to be each and every day of our lives. So many things we hear about we, can never happen without repentance. And we thank you for loving us enough to drive us to that place where you want us to repent so we can experience who you are in all of your glory and everything you want to do in our lives. And I pray that today would be a banner day for Church of the Savior and the kingdom of heaven. And I pray that you would have your way and not a single word would come back void. You watch over your word to perform over it. And I pray that not a single word would fall to the ground or on deaf ears. And that you would have your way in all across every single heart that's watching online. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the best two minutes, people in Kentucky love saying this, the best two minutes in sports is what? The Kentucky Derby. I know so many of you said that in your living room. But millions of people will tell you that the best two-minute event is when there is a total eclipse of the sun. In 2017, the U.S. celebrated uh, the last solar eclipse of the sun. 215 million people, which is close to 88% of the U.S. population, came out for the two-minute thrill of a lifetime to see the sun disappear. I think it was a pickpockets national holiday. And for two minutes, the sun was blocked in broad daylight. Now, backtrack thousands of years ago, people have been trying to block the Son of God from coming to this world and solving mankind's biggest problem of sin, entering into the world and separating us from a holy God. Now, have you ever thought of what life would be like if the opposite of a total eclipse of the sun happened? Imagine living in total darkness all the time, separated from the sun forever, Never seeing the light, never seeing hope, never seeing forgiveness, never seeing love, eternally separated from God and the people you love the most. You see, you need to know that there's a God who loves you, but there's also a devil who hates you, who has been working overtime for thousands of years, deceiving you and keeping you from the cross with his tricks, his schemes, his strategies. Now, most of the time, he never has to work any harder than making you believe the three biggest lies that he presented to Eve in the garden. You see, he showed up with three lies that were designed to induce doubt, deception, and disobedience. 
Line number one, did God really say? Doubt. You believe that? You start doubting. Line number two, that won't kill you. Uh, You'll never die. That's deception. Line number three, you can be just like God, knowing good from evil. In other words, you can have your own moral code. You don't need anyone to tell you what to do, what's right and what's wrong. Here's the translation of that. Do whatever you want to do, but just don't obey God and his word, the teachings of Jesus and the leading of the Holy Spirit to guide you into truth. Do whatever you want to do, but just don't do those things. And those three lies have kept people coming to the cross for years. The millions of people are walking around calling themselves Christians, thinking that they're saved, but they have been deceived. And they're stuck in darkness because of their unbelief and the enemy's best plans to blind their minds. They're probably thinking, what do you mean? Aren't you talking a lot, a lot of stuff about the enemy and blinding their minds? He doesn't do that. Well, Scripture says, paints a picture different story. 2 Corinthians 4, 4, it says, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. You know what I've discovered? The God of this age has blinded the minds of believers too. The God of this age has blinded the minds of churches too. The last church I worked at actually would make fun of certain churches like COS. Even the words that we use. I'll never forget the first pastor that I served under. I came here to speak about three years ago before I came on staff. And he said this to me. He said, you're not going to speak at a church like that as if it was beneath me to speak at a church like Church of the Savior. And then in a staff meeting, I'll never forget this, they presented a list of about 50 or 60 words that we were never allowed to use when communicating with people in our church. And this just blew me away. Here's, a, here's some of the list. These were, these were words we were forbidden to say. Born again, could never say that. Lost, we could never say the word salvation, could never say the word saved, could never mention the word faith. And here comes the big three. We could never mention the word sin, repent, or repentance. You see, he blinds their minds to their sin condition. He blinds their minds about their pride condition. He blinds their minds by keeping them from the foot of the cross, by doing everything in his power to keep people from humbling themselves and really repenting. See, repent and repentance is a word you don't often hear much of in the church today. You never hear the word sin being used unless it's used, unless it's read in scripture to make a point. But here's something else that may shock you. People in the Bible have also resisted this idea of repentance. There's a story about a guy named Jonah. Most of you know the story of Jonah. God tells Jonah to go preach a message of repentance to a wicked city named Nineveh. And Jonah just completely runs in the opposite direction. And Jonah gets into a lot of trouble, finds himself on a ship. There's a lot of consequences. There's judgment coming down. They throw him overboard on a ship. A a fish swallows him for three days. And Jonah comes to his senses and he repents. He tells God he's sorry. And he tells God, I'll go. I'll do what you want me to do. But Jonah is actually not being fully obedient. He's going to go. But he already knows what God's going to do, and he's already mad about the situation. I think Jonah was part judgmental and part bitter and unforgiving. And I just think that because of his mindset and his attitude, uh, he got himself into a big, big mess. And he knew where he was going. So he finally agrees, and he goes, preaches a message of repentance to the city of Nineveh. And actually, the whole city repents, and God pours out his grace, and Jonah gets teed off. Matter of fact, he gets so angry that God pours out his grace because they really repented that he became suicidal. And twice at the end of Jonah's story, he tells God to leave. He tells God, why don't you just let me alone and just let me die? See, this is what unforgiveness and bitterness, and this is what the resistance to people really repenting will do. Probably one of the best stories of repentance in the Bible is David's story. Most of you know about King David. Uh, And I love this about King David. Uh, He's just a great man of God. I mean, the first thing ever said about King David was he was a man after God's own heart. 
God said he will do everything I tell him to do, which is the definition of a man after God's own heart. And the last thing said about David was that he was a man. He, he served God's purpose in his generation, and then he died. Imagine having those two bookend statements said about your life. Uh, but we all know that David had some problems in between those bookend statements. And if you go to 2 Samuel 11, 1, it says this, in the spring at the time when kings go off to war, now if you were a king of Israel and spring came, uh, you had to go fight the battles. You had to lead the, the nation in war. You never stayed home. But it says for s- some reason, at the time when, when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army, And they destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But watch these five words. But David remained in in Jerusalem. David remained in Jerusalem. I have said that these are probably five of the most dangerous words in the Bible. For some reason, he just stayed back. See, David fell victim to the four C's. Complacency, which led to compromise, which led to confusion, which led to catastrophe. See, he got complacent when he stopped fighting, and he found himself in a compromising situation when he locked eyes with a beautiful, naked woman. And it's no mistake that the very next verse, after David remained in Jerusalem, was he found himself on top of a rooftop, and he saw this woman named Bathsheba. You see, his confusion led to him sleeping with her getting her pregnant. And what does every man after God's own heart do when he finds out that the woman who is married to another man is pregnant by him? He has her husband killed. That's what he does. That's what every man after God's own heart does. And after that, David goes on a two-year sin festival of total rebellion. This is a man after God's own heart. This is a man who served God's purpose in his generation, and then he died. You see, his catastrophe is not all that happened that I just outlined for you. His catastrophe was the destination that complacency always leads us to. But I just want to say this today. Thank God for the people that God sends us in our lives that help us repent from our sins. God uses Nathan to confront David, and suddenly David realizes he needs to repent. And he prays a prayer of repentance that is worth modeling in Psalm 51. And here it is. He says, have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion. Blot out the stain of my sin. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin. For I recognize my rebellion. He's taking personal responsibility in this prayer of repentance. It haunts me day and night. Against you and you alone, not anyone, anyone else, have, have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. You will be proved right in what you say, and your judgment against me is just. For I was born a sinner, yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. But you desire honesty from the womb, teaching me wisdom even there. Purify me from my sins, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Oh, give me back my joy again. You have broken me. Now let me rejoice. Don't keep looking at my sin. Remove the stain of my guilt. Create in me a clean heart. I love this, oh God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence because that's what sin does. Sin separates us from a holy God. And don't take your holy spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and make me willing to obey you. Did you catch that? Restore to me the joy of your salvation. See, there are people who are sorry for their sins, but they never repent. David was sorrowful to the point of repentance. The Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 7, I now rejoice, not that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. For you were made sorrowful according to the will of God, so that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance, watch this, without regret, leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. Did you catch that? Repentance that leads to salvation. Now, I want to break that down for you. 
You see, the story of man and God could easily be summed up as follows. God is love. And his love is pure and holy. And God made us in his image. And Adam and Eve, when they sinned, it ruined everything. And we inherited that sin, and we live in a broken world. And because God is holy, he could never be in the presence of sin. Therefore, sin separated us from our loving Father in heaven and gave us a death sentence that declares us guilty. We were incapable of fixing our sin problem and separation from God. Now, separation from those that you love the most will make you do outrageous and radical things. Our Father did just that. He came up with the greatest plan ever, a plan that would restore our relationship with our Father in heaven and bridge the gap back to him, a plan that would forgive anyone for all their sins so they can have a permanent residence in heaven for eternity, a plan that was free to us but cost God everything as he sacrifices one and only son for the payment of our sins, a plan that solved our sin problem when God's son, Jesus Christ, took our sins, became our sins, died for our sins, and defeated our sins on the cross and from the grave. He did that for me. He did that for you. And repentance is the only issue that keeps your eternity hanging in the balance. And the Bible poses this question, 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourself. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. So what steps do I have to take to know that I'm a Christian so I can pass this test? I'm going to outline that for you for the rest of the talk. That's a question that people have been asking since the beginning of time. In the book of Acts, in 1630, a jailer in the city of Philippi put it clearly when he cried out, what must I do to be saved? Paul's response to the jailer was real significant. He said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Not only for you, but you and your household. Peter's first sermon on the day of Pentecost is a great example of this. You see, first Peter preaches full of the Holy Spirit. Before Pentecost, Peter was full of himself, but now he's full of the Holy Spirit. The message burned in people's hearts because they saw it burning in the heart of Peter. And they asked an important question when Peter was done preaching. They said, well, what shall we do? What do we do next? What do we do? We're all in. And Peter said this, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God. Don't miss that. Repent and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, fine, you think, well, what does that actually mean? I think it starts when you could put your name on Romans 3.23, which says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You see, in the original Greek of the New Testament, the word used for sin was actually an archery term. It meant to miss the mark. So if God's perfect standard is a bullseye, how many times have I missed it? Millions, gazillions, maybe just 10 for Anthony, maybe 20 for Pastor Steve, but millions for me. And according to God's flawless standards, no human has ever hit the mark. We all have a sin problem. We all miss the mark. Now, some of us may be farther off than others, but none of us have hit it. And why do we miss it? Because God's mark means absolute, total, complete, flawless perfection. And James 2.10 says this, for the person who keeps all of the laws, except one, just one, is as guilty as the person who has broken all of God's laws. James just messes it up for all of us. But maybe you could think you can do something to earn God's approval. No, there's nothing you can do, even on your best day, to pay your debts. There's nothing you can do to settle the score. We're all guilty. We're all in need of a Savior. Someone who can take our sins away. Someone who can make things right. Enter Jesus Christ. Romans 3.22 says we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for anyone who believes, no matter who we are. This is true for anyone who misses the mark. That's why they call it the good news. Listen, 
I wouldn't trust the best 10 minutes of my life to get me into heaven. It's when you come to God and you say, I know I've got a sin problem. I know I've made mistakes. I know I've sinned. I know I, my need for a Savior. I need you now. I want you to know I'm so sorry for the way I've lived like you don't exist. I want all of that to change. You know what the Bible calls that? That's repentance. Like I said, it's a word you don't often hear a lot. But I will tell you this. It's the first recorded message and the central message that Jesus Christ preached everywhere he went. You know, we, we talk a lot about the words of Jesus and the teachings of Jesus. And I believe that everything Jesus has ever said is worth a sermon and is worth hearing about and it's worth learning about and it's worth living for. But the one message that he preached over and over and over is this. From then on, Jesus began to preach, repent of your sins and turn to God for the kingdom of heaven is near. You see the phrase kingdom of God occurs 68 times in 10 different New Testament books, while the kingdom of heaven occurs only 32 times, only in the gospel of Matthew. Jesus was in essence saying, when I establish my kingdom, which is not of this world, you become a kingdom representative. And it's not just a kingdom that'll be coming someday when I return. You don't have to wait for me to come back and restore things and that's when the kingdom will come. He says, no, it's a kingdom that is near you. It's a kingdom that is within you. And I'm going to establish my kingdom rule and my kingdom principles, guess where? In your heart. I want to be, I just want to establish everything. I want you to inherit everything I have inside of you. That's why he said it's near you. It's within you. I want the righteousness of peace and joy in the Holy Spirit and all the benefits of salvation. I want you to have that. And then I want you to accept all I have for you. And you have to accept it by faith. But the starting point for you to accept all of that is for you to repent. That's why repent is such a critical word. Repent is when you are so sorry and remorseful for your sins that you turn from your sins and you turn to Jesus. Acts 17.30 says this, In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. This is for all of us. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. And he has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. Repent is a pivotal word. So let's just break it down. What does it mean? It means to change. It means to turn. It means, it means if you're walking in a direction, you just start walking in the opposite direction that you're going in. It's like driving down the highway. You just, see a, you just start driving in the opposite direction. You see, but more than simply being sorry, it's a word of action. See, many people feel remorse for their sins, but they never really repent. See, you can feel miserable for the way your actions have wreaked havoc in your life, but still not be broken. You can continue to use, continue to drink, continue to watch porn, continue to gamble, continue to have sex outside of marriage, to remain bitter and try and excuse it and justify it all, and all the while be completely miserable. But brokenness, true repentance, true godly sorrow is the decision to say, I am so sorry for the pain I've caused others, myself, my family, most importantly to you, God. And I'm turning away from my sins. I'm turning away. I'm not only repenting of them, I'm turning away from them and I'm turning to you, my king, because you're my only hope. You see, remorse is being sorry. Repentance is being sorry enough to stop. It's so critical. Repentance is finally agreeing with God about what you do and stopping the madness of self-justification. While repenting is turning from our sins, faith is turning our hearts and our lives to Jesus Christ. And when we do this, we open up our lives to the healing, reconciling, restoring, uplifting grace of Jesus Christ who loves us despite ourselves. Romans 10, 9 
tells us how to do this and how to ask him into our lives. Most of you know this scripture. It says that if you confess with your mouth, so important to verbalize it, confess it with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. But here it is, not only confess it with your mouth, but believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You'll be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it's with your mouth that you confess and are saved. So what does it mean to believe? Let's break that down. This kind of faith means that you realize that Jesus Christ is the very son of God. He's the one who loves you so much that he died on a cross 2,000 plus years ago and paid the penalty for your sin and rose from the dead three days later. It is God's desire for you to believe that and ask him into your life so that you can let his life define your life. But believing is not just to have mere intellectual assent. To believe is not simply acknowledging the facts that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. He lived, he died, he defeated the death in the grave, and he rose again. There's a lot of people that believe that. James 2.19 says this, you believe that there's one God, good. Even the demons believe that and shudder, what else you got? See, to believe runs deeper than that. To believe, as the word is used in the Bible, is to put your trust in, is to cling to, is to rely on, is to love, and is to obey God. See, when you say, I believe in Jesus Christ, you're saying in your heart and verbalizing with your mouth, I realize my need for a Savior. I'll put my trust in. I'll cling to him. I'll rely on him. And I'll spend the rest of my life loving him, which means to obey him. See, the word believe also implies letting go of something. If I'm clinging to one thing, I'm letting go of another thing. It's so important. I'm going to decide to walk in a new way. And I'm not ashamed to tell anyone else that it's Jesus Christ I'm walking with. I'm going to get up out of my mess. I'm going to get up out of the situation that I'm in. And I'm going to start walking towards that cross. You see, the prodigal son, most of you know that story, could have repeated his refrain, I am no longer worthy to be called your son over and over and over again. He could have said it the rest of his life and remained separated from his father. But he did more than repeat those words. He acted on them. He got up out of his situation. He repented. And he started walking in a new direction. He started coming back home. Matter of fact, he started running back home. I had to do the same. You have to do the same. And when we do, we hear the words that that boy heard from his father. Welcome home. Welcome home. See, the Bible says you run to God, he'll run to you. But here's what's interesting about this story. The son who ran off and blew his inheritance repented and headed back towards his father. The father could have rescued him. The father could have went out wherever he was, but he didn't. But the father was looking. The father was waiting. And he couldn't wait for his son to come back, but the son had to make the next move. See, God always makes the first move on us. God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were sinners, he died for us. Our next move is to repent. And God won't make the next move until we repent. We have to repent. And when he repented and started coming home, the father met him. The father ran to him. Do you know who else needed to repent in that story? His brother. You see, there are runaway prodigals who forsake everything about God. They reject the church, Jesus, the word. They blow their lives. They get arrested. They do so many hideous things. And it's always amazing when they come home and they have a radical salvation, a radical party thrown for them in heaven. Because when one sinner repents, there's a party going on in heaven in the presence of the angels. There's another group of prodigals that I want to touch, I want to talk about this morning. There are religious prodigals. See, the brother lived in the father's house. He had son privileges the religious prodigal comes to church. Sometimes they sing on the worship team. Sometimes they're eating a bunch of donuts, gossiping about people in the lobby. Sometimes they're on deacon-possessed boards. Sometimes they're on elder boards. They get FOMO, fear of missing out, when someone else gets a party thrown for them. They put on the pout face 
when someone else gets showered with undeserved grace. In essence, they're like Jonah. Because Jonah knew that God was a forgiving, gracious God. That was his argument with God. I know you, God. You're a forgiving God. You're a gracious God. You're slow to anger. You're really going to forgive those people, aren't you? Jonah said, no way. I'm out. Just let me die. The religious prodigals need to come home too. The religious need to repent too. The religious prodigals need to see God in a different light. Otherwise, revival will never break out in our church. See, most people think that revival is going to break out when lost people get radically saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. We need that to happen. We need to go out. That's why we do EE. That's why we have encounter, so that we can go out. But revival is going to break out when the saved saints get real about their sins and really repent and humble themselves before a holy God. That's when revival is going to break out. Then they get filled with the Spirit. Then they go out and witness, and the multitudes get saved, and that's when real revival happens. You know, when we kicked off this 40 days of prayer, which I'm so grateful that as a church, we believe in the power of prayer. Steve Preach opened up the series talking about Isaiah 6, and he gave us a recipe for revival. I'm going to ask the worship team to start making their way up. This is a great picture of revival. When you think about this, in the year that King Isaiah died, he sees, he walks into this worship service, and something happens. You see, when humanity and the holiness of God collide, the only response from humanity is to repent and do whatever God wants us to do. And when we're in God's presence, and I pray that wherever you are in your home, your living room, wherever you are right now, you know that you're in God's presence. The only realization is to see our need for a Savior in our sinful state. The only realization is to repent. The only realization is to see God in a different light. This past weekend, I was up at the Brooklyn Tabernacle And the moment they started worshiping and people were singing out their lungs, I only did one thing because I knew I was in the presence of God. I repented even before I said a word. I just know that when I'm in the the presence and the holiness of God, the only option is to repent. See, Isaiah, here's the interesting thing about it. Isaiah was a man who walked with God. He talked with God. He had a relationship with God. He could hear the voice of God. He had an intimate relationship with God. But when he saw the Lord high and lifted up in a worship service in all of his glory, he saw God in a different light that day. He saw God in all of his glory. He saw God as the holy God that he is. And when he did, his first words were, woe to me. I cried, for I'm ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Translation, I repent. I'm doomed without your grace and forgiveness. I don't deserve to be in your presence. And whenever there's real repentance, there's never any hesitation of God pouring out his grace and forgiveness. Look what it says in the scripture. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongues from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And I said, here I am. Send me. You see what grace does? Grace immediately gets poured out on him and then directions come. I love this. See, this is the recipe for revival. People start seeking the face of God in prayer. People get in the presence of God. People worship God in spirit and in truth. People acknowledge the holiness of God. People realize their need for grace. Then people repent. Then people cry out to God. And now the prayers are different. 
God pours out his spirit. God purifies our souls and forgives us of our sins. And then God tells us to go and share it with the world. And we say yes and we go. People see the word and the Holy Spirit burning in our hearts. God burns the word in their hearts. And they get radically saved. They respond and the multitudes start coming to Christ. That's the recipe for revival. Here's what I've learned. If you want to get close to God, you got to learn how to run errands for the Holy Spirit. And if you run errands for the Holy Spirit, you got to be filled with the Spirit of God so you can hear the voice of God. And to be filled with the Spirit of God and hear the voice of God, you got to do what Peter tells us to do in Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's the starting point. That's why the cross exists. So wherever you are today, I want to give you an opportunity. doesn't matter if you're in your kitchen, in your car. doesn't matter if you're at Walmart. I don't care where you are. At this moment, I'm just going to ask you to shut it all down. I want to lead you in a prayer to come to the cross. Not a physical cross, but a place in your heart. A place where you can either accept Jesus Christ for the first time or make a recommitment to him. And then have the opportunity to just tell God whatever you need to tell God. Because right now, and here's what we prayed for, you are in the presence of God. Right now, God has come to you where you're at. So I want to lead you in this prayer. I want you to pray this prayer out loud with me right now. Father, I have sinned against you. I've sinned against others and myself. I repent of my sins and turn from my sins. I trust in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of my sins and the free gift of eternal life. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and I believe that he died for my sins and rose from the dead. So I can live with him forever in heaven and for him here on earth. I acknowledge Jesus as my Savior and my Lord. It is my desire to love you back by fully devoting my life to you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit so I will have the power and the grace to live the life you planned for me thousands of years ago. Thank you for loving and forgiving me. Thank you for welcoming me into your family and making me a child of the one true king. If you prayed that prayer, congratulations and welcome to the kingdom of heaven. Welcome to the family. Now listen, whatever decision that you made, whether it's a recommitment or you gave your life to Christ for the first time, would you let us know online? Would you post that? Would you put that in the comments section so that we can know and we'll know how to pray for you? And we just want to, and whatever it is that God lays on your heart, just let us know how we can pray for you. We're going to have a little quiet time of reflection. For you to just spend time in God's presence reflecting on the decision and the prayer that you just prayed. And then we're going to close our service out in worship. Thank you for trusting in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, for your sins, for your salvation, and for your life. You are a way maker. Thank you for making a way when there was no way. See, repentance gets us to that place where God made that way for us when there wasn't a way. I hope that you are blessed by this message because repentance is so key. I told you it's a beautiful word. It's a beautiful concept because it exposes the beauty of God and allows us to get into his presence. Repentance precedes salvation. It precedes reconciliation. We're reconciled back to our Father. It precedes inhabitation, being filled with the Holy Spirit. It precedes his grace being poured out upon us. 
and then his mission defined in our lives. I pray that all of that was fulfilled. And now you have a new mission because of repentance. Now you're as clean and as holy and there's no separation between you and God. It's a beautiful concept to worship God in all of his glory and to be in his presence and to love him knowing that there's no barriers now between us and a holy God. Because guess what? While we may not be holy, he declares us holy by his grace. That's a wonderful thing. And we have to believe that by faith because it is true. Hope you have a great week. Keep praying. We'll continue to pray and trust God to be that way maker, miracle worker. God bless you.